That song kind of became, uh, I don't know, my favorite song this year, but I guess I better introduce myself, huh, before I start that mess. Huh? I get emotional when I really think about the overwhelming weight and the glory of God on us as human beings, and what He gives to us and allows us to have and participate with Him in is absolutely the most phenomenal thing that life could ever give to you. I'm just telling you, I can't even describe it. I don't want to tell you a story about that in a minute. But I can't even describe what he does when he puts his glory on you and, and all the weight of who he is in you. And it's just powerful. By the way, my name is Rod Quartzen. For some of you that don't know me, uh, I'm from Highland Lakes Camp. And, and uh, uh, this is really our home church for us. Uh, we don't get to be in church. So some of you go, well, I haven't seen that guy. And, you know, even in a long time, right, Kevin? But it's still considered our home church. Uh, we don't get to participate in church a whole lot. We're at the camp and we work and travel and and uh, matter of fact, a bunch of my friends from camp are here this morning, so didn't know all that was going to happen, so that's pretty cool. We're excited about that, for them being here. And, um, you know, we get to see some amazing things week in and week out. And in the summer, uh, when God begins to move, um, and through prayer and planning, I mean, He is in the business of life change. And so when He changes a life, it's not just for today or, or happenstance, it's forever, right. all right? And so it's one of those things that um, I think the church struggles with. I know I struggled with for a long time, trying to understand what this Christian life is about and what church is about and just all of those things. A lot of stuff just doesn't, you know, make sense to me. And I'm not a real educated guy. I'm not real sharp. I just know that one day I was blind and the next day I could see. That's it, right? And so... Now, now that I see, I see Christ, you know, doing things uh, across the, the land and in the church that's just absolutely the most amazing thing ever. And there seems to be, you know, a movement of God. And one of the things, uh, Dustin, by the way, uh, was in my, my team this summer. We were on the media team and did production and things like that. And so he was on our team this summer. And uh, one of the kind of the, every day we did a Bible study. And from the very day, the f- first day, all the way to the end, uh, what was the saying? We all need Jesus, right? And it's like, and it seems clichéic, you know, but it's more than just the lost world that needs Jesus. You and I need him every single day. And the minute that we walk without him, we're in deep trouble. And we'll never know the beauty and the glory. And so, um, I, I, and it's one of the things I've kind of become a broken record about is, Uh, In Romans chapter 6, which is my favorite chapter, we're not going to go there just yet, but Romans chapter 6 is one of my favorite chapters. And he says in Romans chapter 6 verse 11, that consider yourself dead. Consider that you have been crucified. And the word consider is to believe. And and it's it's an accounting term. Credit it into that column. You have been crucified. And so you've been crucified with Christ. You're not just dead because you're still living. You're still walking in front of me. So what does that mean? That's right. First, you had to go through the death, right? The death of self. But the beauty is the resurrection. But it's not you that comes out of the grave. It's Christ in you. Right? And so, um, just funny, I was talking with Gary this morning. We were, like I said, we already had church, so I don't even sure where to start here. So, you know, we just might dive in the middle and who knows. But, um, and this is kind of off where I wasn't planning on this, but... um, It's one of those things that you don't have to live in sin. I don't have to live in sin. We can live in freedom in Christ Jesus. And so then you start, you have to get real honest with yourself when you're living that way. Or just any way for that matter. Just today, just however you are. I don't know, however you came to the door. You just got to be real honest with yourself. You know, and man, you start looking at self and talking to self and asking self, you know, what's going on inside this old heart of mine? Sometimes you just don't get the answers that you like and it gets really tough. And you're confronted sometimes with some real hard truths. But here's the fact is, uh, Jesus um, didn't save you just to put you on a shelf. All right? He didn't save any of us to put us on a shelf. There's a reason why he came and why you're saved. And um, I asked this kid this summer, we are sitting talking, and he was just really struggling with his relationship with God. And, and I said, um, what's required to be a Christian? You know, to, to be a Christian, what, is, what does that mean to you? And he started giving me the typical church answers. And, uh, and finally, uh, and how I would respond to every one of them. Uh, and he, he came to one that was, well, you just got to believe. And I said, well, you know, 
uh, the Muslims believe. Um, they believe, pretty devoutly believe. Um, the demons believe. Well, then, and he just, he couldn't answer. He finally says, I don't know then. What does it mean to be a Christian? I said, it's, it's real simple. It's Christ in you. That's the difference between you and anyone else that believes in a God. Your God is alive, and He is in you. He is in me. Those that believe other things, there is no God in them. And so now you start thinking about this. And so one of the things that, that, I, that uh, I really believe is that when we die to self and allow Christ to live, Galatians 2.20, you know, when it's no longer I that live, it's Christ that lives, right? And most of you probably know that. But when he does the living, then it changes everything. And something happened to me, and it just reminded me, talking with Gary, you know, 20-something years ago when I was sitting at that table, and God began to speak to me, and God began to, to call me out. And something happened that day that was so powerful, so moving, so emotional, so just absolutely life-changing that I still haven't got over it. Did you get that? I haven't got over what happened that day. And they told me, oh, it'll wear off, Rod. It'll wear off. It'll wear off, Gary. It's going to wear off. You'll, 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 you'll come down, and it'll, you'll come down here where we all are. If that's it, then, man, that's not who I met that day. That day when God called me out, it changed my life so much that it, I'll never be the same. I can't go back. I can't even think about going back. I can't even, I don't, there's no desire to go back. But then there's this problem that I'm still alive and I'm still in the flesh and I still have desires and I still have thoughts and I still have my ways. And I just started trying to put Christian terms and Christianese and make them Christian, you know. And so then it was kind of, let's go to church. And, and then it was, I felt holy and I felt good. And I thought, man, that's great. This is, this is awesome. And then you start encountering the attack, you know. And then it's like, hmm, this ain't no fun. This isn't, I didn't sign up for this part. And then the attack comes from somebody inside the church. You go, know, ooh, that, where'd that come from? You know, and then it's just one thing after another, and it's like um, something's really wrong with this picture. And it's taken 20 years for me to get to this point of believing and trusting. And the difference is in the belief part of you and I and them is that we trust in our God. They don't trust in their God. We trust. So what's that mean for us? Um, I'm just going to talk a couple. Let's look at Romans um, chapter 10, verse uh, 14. And, uh, and I hope it's okay that I use the iPad for some folks that are diehard print folks. I'm not anymore. And so I don't even know what print looks like hardly uh, in a book. So anyway, it's all on iPad. It works really well. Um, Romans chapter 10, uh, verse 14. Um, how then uh, will they call on him? whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him who they have not heard? How will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. Amen. Verse 16, however, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, uh, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And so, you know, that by the word of Christ, look at Colossians uh, 3.16. And uh, you can put it up on the board if you want. Colossians 3.16 uh, it says, Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another, with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts. The word of Christ is God in you. And we are the ones that, how will they know, how will they hear, if, if we are not the ones out telling them, if we're not out being that. Well, how can you be that if you're alive in the flesh? Think about it for a second. I see a lot of people, um, they're kind of like The Walking Dead. Anybody watch that show? I know some folks watch that show. It's like The Walking Dead, Dead Man Walking maybe. Um, I see a lot of people in the church that they, they've, they're saved. They know Christ. They've been crucified. So they're dead to sin and all that. But they're just dead men walking. There's no power. There's no life. There's nothing in them. And they can preach it, and like Gary and I said, they, they know the words, and they know Scripture better than, way better than I. I mean, they can quote at least 50 verses. I can quote maybe one. 
You know, and, uh, that's just the way it is. I, my brain doesn't function the same as some of the others. But the fact is, what's the difference? And that's the only difference. But they're saved, right? You know, so if they're walking dead and they're saved, but they're not experiencing this life of freedom in Christ, what's the problem? The problem is Galatians 2.20. They haven't died to themselves. And so what happens at the, uh, at the point of salvation? Okay? I mean, when you're confronted with Christ and confronted with sin, you are then buried once you receive. You're buried, right? Dead, buried. And He is the one who is risen. And He says, you are risen with Him. The problem is what happens is we try to rise up out of the grave and walk on our own. We start thinking, especially if you're a smart person, you know, I'm not one of those, but if you're one of those smart people, then what you try to do is you're going to rationalize everything. You're going to think through things. You might go to school and have lots of knowledge and then depend on knowledge, and the knowledge will fail you. Or you might be a real feeling person. I'm a very touchy-feely guy, so I'm the kind that, you know, has the, I cry and easily and those kind of things. So then it's all about the emotion. And then, no, there isn't. And then, but if that's all it is, we're wrong. You know, it's when the desires of my flesh and what I want when I want, and I want it now. And it's probably nobody knows that part but me, right? You know? It's that know-it-all attitude. I know what I know, and I want what I want, and I want it now. And it's alive and well in the church. One of the things that Cameron told me, he said, uh, Rod, you're going to find, you know, our church is unified. And that's rare, actually. And it shouldn't be. It should be a common occurrence. But it's actually a rare thing. And, you know, people, he describes you to me as being alive. He is more excited about what's happening here in this body than he's ever been in his life. You know, and so, and I can see it. When I, when I see into the faces, you know, across this room and I hear the voices and some of the same faces I've, you know, been hugged by for two years now, you know, it's like, yeah, I, no wonder. So the encouragement maybe today, you know, the difference in dead man walking, and, and I just kind of had some thoughts about the, well, here, let me, let me read something from Oswald Chambers I think might be interesting. It says, the one marvelous secret of a holy life uh, lies not in imitating Jesus, but in letting the perfection of Jesus manifest themselves in my mortal flesh. It is his patience, his love, his holiness, his faith, his purity, his godliness, that is manifested in and through every sanctified soul. So it's all about Jesus. I mean, it's all, it's all about Him. You know, and so when you start looking through, like I'd say to Gary, I said, just look at any New Testament book, and it's all the same thing. Right? It's all the same. Start looking. It's die to self and alive into Christ. The gospel's really simple. It's not that hard. We make it way harder than it has to be. And we start looking for understanding because life is hard. You know, when things start thrown at us, life is hard. You know, bad things happen, life is hard. And so we start trying to get understanding. But the fact is, Jesus cries with you and he hurts with you. And those things aren't fun for him either. You know, he feels your pain. He feels the next person's pain. And he's right there with you. And in him, we can walk. And it's powerful. But the person, what I call the dead man alive, is the person who understands who Christ Jesus is and surrenders their life and gives it all to him. So if you, whatever it is you do, I don't know what you folks do, I have no clue. I don't know what you do for a living, but whatever you do for a living or whatever God's put on you, whatever education you have or don't have, you have it because, for one reason. One reason. And it's easy to say to glorify Jesus, but it's more than that. It's you to die to self, and he will use all of those things to spread the gospel. And the reason the song, you know, is, is kind of so powerful to me, um, I don't always trust enough. You know, and I want to, I want to go way beyond the borders. You know, I, I just I want to go way beyond where, where I am. I want to be able to trust God with so much and everything, and, but I start rationalizing, well, God doesn't look like this, it doesn't act like that, I don't like what he did, I don't like what she did, and then before you know it, I'm thinking all about self and all about rod and then i miss the beauty of who god is in the alive and here's one of the things that happened this summer um we had uh i get to sit in the back and we watched i don't know 60 
some odd services maybe. You know, we get to sit through every single one of them, uh, the team that I was on. And so, um, and I was telling, I think it was a Chris in the back, I was, uh, you know, it's like you never get tired of watching when God is moving and doing things. And, you, and just think about going to a church service twice a day, every day, for 90 days. You know, it just about. And some people are going, oh my gosh, that, once a week's bad enough. It's twice a day, every day. And then you start thinking, well, it's got to get old. You're singing the same songs or this or that. You know what? When you watch God move and people respond, it never, ever, ever gets old. And so one of those times, I'm going to tell you two, two stories. But uh, one of those times, um, and I'm going to tell a story that kind of uh, extend what Rusty was talking about. And they prayed over these chairs. And it was this first, um, one of the first nights, and uh, it was the first night of camp for this particular group, and Bruce had walked in, and he prayed through the first three rows of chairs, and then he, he moved on and was praying over some other chairs, and kind of like what Russ said, he prayed over these three chairs, and so he was focusing on the three chairs through the whole time. He didn't even think about anything else he did. He just felt like the Lord said, just watch those three chairs. And of course, then he watched those three chairs, and those three kids get saved, and I said, but Bruce, did you see the whole front three rows? And he says, yeah, I noticed that. Did you know that you came in and you started and you prayed those front three rows? All 42 kids in the front three rows stood at the invitation. (laughs) Yeah, it's cool that God is way more uh, sovereign than that, right? Yeah, but it was the, the... so, you know, here we're sitting there watching this, you know, because it's not normal for, you know, uh, and so they're like, are they looking at each other or what's happening? Do they all decide to lock arms and stand, you know, and you're asking, and no, they stood and they, they made professions of faith. And, and so I, I told Josh, I said, man, Josh, go follow that. Follow those people out. Find out what's going on. There's a story right there. And so then we went and interviewed the youth minister. And the lady, it was a young lady who was a youth minister, and she had a guy that was with them who was six foot two or so. He's a real tall guy, probably 65 years old, and I thought it was the pastor. And so, and he was just standing back there, just totally overwhelmed, just blown away by what he was watching. You know, he didn't even know what to do. Well, come to find out, the youth minister was gone, and he was left, and he was a deacon that came last minute because they didn't have anybody to go. So he went as a, uh, you know, as a sponsor, and he's sitting over there watching this happen and just totally didn't know what to do, totally blown away, you know, and so he tells us in the interview, he says, I've never experienced anything like that in my life, and so then we're asking the lady, okay, this, what, what happened, you, you guys had to have some preparation before, she said, yes, we prayed, we prayed, and, uh, but we had 10 kids that backed out just right before camp, and so then we were like, oh, great, we got 10 spots, so what are we going to do, and so they just, they, they met, and they prayed, and they asked the Lord, and they thought, do we just go with who we have, and let that be, and the Lord says, no, go to the streets and find 10 people, just offer You can't guess what happened, can you? All ten kids were saved. All ten, first night. They were just blown away. And they said it changed our group. Our kids were blown away. They confessed sin. They had a revival in their group. Just because somebody said, not me, but you, what do we do? They could have been thinking about the money. They could have been thinking about all kinds of things. And they just said, we're just going to ask the Father. His plans were much bigger than ours. And then there was another group, um, preteen, one of our last preteen camps. I think it was the last preteen camp. A guy from Harlingen, Texas, brought 50-some-odd kids up from Harlingen, Texas. And this is third, fourth, and fifth, and sixth graders. So, you know, most of those have an attention span of a gnat, you know, just, uh, just long enough to hear something and head out to the concession stand and go. After the worship was over and uh, there was this back couple of rows of kids sitting there and some adults and, you know, we noticed some, you know, crying and hugging and talking and going, okay, what's going on? And then you notice uh, a, a man and and a boy really embracing and hugging. And, of course, for us, you know, we're trained. You've got to watch out. You know, just, who is this? What's going on? Well, it turned out that was his son. And so, and it was for some of the others. And it happened to be the pastor of the church and his son. And so, uh, you know, I went down to talk to him. And there was just so much happening. That, I mean, I couldn't talk to him right then. So then at the bell ringing ceremony, 
um, went out and I said, hey, did you have a good week? He says, oh, yeah, uh, you can't imagine. I said, he says, we're, we brought 50-some kids and only five were lost that we knew of. The other ones we knew. We do a lot of evangelism and discipleship and prayer and things before we come. So camp's a little different for us. It's not about the evangelism. But, however, one of those five is saved, and that's why we're here at the Bell. I was like, oh, man, praise the Lord. And he says, yeah, but what happened last night? And he says, He said, uh, those boys uh, experience God. He said, some confess sin. Some felt God's love for the first time in their life. They were so overwhelmed. They stayed for 45 minutes. 45 minutes. Third, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. In the presence of the Lord. And he says, um, and the pastor said, never seen anything like it. Pastor for 20 plus years. And he says, called home to the wife. She goes, how'd it go? I can't explain it. I, I, can't, I can't put words. Put the kid on the phone. What happened? Mama. The overwhelming presence of God changes people. Those kids will never, ever, ever forget what God did that day. Most of us miss out. And hear me, church. Most of us miss out on the overwhelming presence of God because our thinking is in the way. Our will, our flesh is in the way. Our understanding, our theology, our whatever you want to put in there is in the way. And if you come as a child and just say, Daddy, I, I don't understand, but I'm here. He will blow the doors off. And I used to think maybe it's just because I'm the emotional guy. Maybe that's just it, you know. But then I have an interview of a guy, a youth minister, brought four kids to camp. And he's telling us how excited, how God moved in those four kids and changed their lives. All four of those kids gave their life to Christ. The year, or they brought seven, excuse me. The year before, they brought seven. All seven of those have surrendered to ministry, got saved at camp, surrendered to ministry. This year, four of the seven have gotten saved. And he says, I cried like a baby. He says, I don't cry. I'm a tough man. I don't do that mess. And he says, I cried like a baby. When you are struck with the overwhelming presence of God, it just changes you. And I'm going somewhere with this. So that's the dead man alive who is Christ in you, living and you're overwhelmed. Dead man walking is someone who has the belief and has been saved, but they're just, there's no feeling, there's no emotion, there's nothing to it, there's no purpose. And then you get really good at faking it and being religious and you can quote all the scripture and, and do all those things. The dead man alive just says, all I know is I once could see and once I was blind and now I see. The dead man alive says, I, I don't know. God's presence just floored me. And all I know is I'm going that way. He says, go, I'm going. Then there's one more person. And, um, and I just think, I, you know, I might have been watching Shark Week this week. I don't know if there's anybody. For the first time in the summer, we get to watch it. We got to watch it this year. And, and, um, and one of the cool, interesting things about these sharks, and um, it was one I was watching yesterday, uh, and the sharks would hover at the bottom in the darkness, and they'd wait for the prey to flail and hurt and have whatever's going on up here, and they would strike straight up from the bottom and strike their prey and eat them. And so it's like the third person for us is fish bait. Just think about it. And it's the people that are out there that are floundering in the water, have no idea, maybe even call themselves atheists because of what's happened inside the church, maybe what's happened in their family, maybe uh, they've been hurt by something else, I don't know. I, I can name off thousands of things and so can you, but it's the person who's just flailing and their arms are waving and they don't know what to do and all of a sudden the demons from hell just snatch them. 
and the scripture says that if you are disobedient, your heart becomes hardened. Now, we all think about Pharaoh when we think about that part. So I'll just, there's three scriptures that point to this. But Pharaoh hardened his own heart first because he was disobedient to Christ Jesus or to God at that point. All right? And in that, then God said, now I'm going to use that for my glory. And he just punished him and made it harder. Do you know the New Testament says the same thing? Romans 1.24 says that they will give you over to your own lusts. And that's the punishment for disobedience. And so for us in the church, how do we become dead men walking? Because we've been given over to our own lusts, our own desires, our own knowledge, our own way that makes sense to us. The miracle of God does not make sense. It did not make sense when you know, kids stand up and give their life to Christ. It does not. Well, we had, there's one of the pictures we have of a, this lady, grown lady, walking through, ringing the bell. I'm like, who is that? One of the leaders got saved and walking through. You know, so you never know who is there. Uh, so many give their life to Christ. I had 354 people that said yes to Jesus. I'm going to go to the ministry and follow Christ in, in, in service. And that just doesn't happen without something major happening. So you can't explain those kind of things. How does a six-year-old say, God's calling me to ministry? Or a sixth grader called God. And you're going, mm, man, you've got a lot of life ahead. You have no idea what you're talking about. And I've heard that over and over. And as a youth minister, I've heard that over and over. Those youth don't know what they're talking about. And you know what? When God calls, he calls. And I don't care what age you are, it calls. And it's the same. It, it never goes away. And you might be 30 before you finally go, oh, I remember that call. You know? But it never goes away. And then that person who, whose heart becomes hardened um, becomes what I call old and crotchety. And um, some of you old-timers know what that means. And, uh, and I know some of my friends over here don't like that word. But uh, I used it in uh, one of our Bible studies, and I got to thinking about it. Is it really a word? And so then I said something to Dustin about it. He said, yeah, I looked it up. It's actually in the dictionary. And it means grumpiness. And then the word, the base word, crotchet, is a surgical instrument with a sharp hook on the end so now think about being a grumpy person with a sharp hook on the end and how hurtful and damaging to your life and to the church and to the world that is so I don't want to be that guy and I don't think you want to be that guy and the only way not to be that guy is to surrender your life to Christ Jesus die to self and let him do the living because it's only goodness comes from him. You can't act good. You know, you can't even love people. Only he can do that. But when he does that through you and you experience that love, oh my. It changes everything. Right? And then when you become old and crotchety, sometimes you're out there and you become fish bait. And we know people that are that. I don't want to be that guy either. I saw the first Shark Week show that the thing came up and ate the man right out of the water. Like, mm, man, I don't want to be that. And the enemy does lots and lots of damage. And we fight with each other, and we have our own ways, our own thoughts. So many things. Our families, we fight with our spouses. We fight with our children. We fight with the bosses. You know what? You don't have to fight with anybody. Dead man can't be offended. Don't forget that. Dead man can't be offended. If you're offended, you're not dead. You're a dead man walking, I guess. All offense stays in the grave because it's all on him anyway. It makes a major difference. And so here's the deal. We want God to expand our borders, right? We want to be able to trust beyond because God wants to... And there's some of you that are... They're giving up and, and doing missions, and not just missions down the street. We're talking about missions across the world and moving your whole families and, you know, really doing, having to raise funds and do all kinds of crazy things to be able to follow the Lord in that. But there's some of you who are still in this room and that you're going to be here in this town. And you know what? This is the hardest town to be a missionary in in probably the whole United States, next to San Francisco maybe. This is it. Mission Huge mission field. And it's not because of what, what you think. It's just because people do it their way here. That's just the way it is. And they are hungry and needing Jesus. And you will never be, in Romans 10, you will never be the word of Christ to them unless 
Christ Jesus is in you and you're dead to self. As long as you are the word of Christ, you bring life. You walk in the light. And it makes a difference. When I walked through the door today and met Gary, you know, I already knew right away from when he walked through the door, this man knows Jesus. I didn't have to even hear his words. I could see this man knows Jesus. And then when I get to hear the words, it's like, whoa. And his family, you know, and just the old friends of the same thing. I was looking forward to being here. You know, just I, I, knew, I knew what you'd do. And I've experienced that every time I come to this place. But even at movie theaters. Y'all know what I'm talking about. One of uh, Mr. Bo over here. We'd known each other, but you know, you don't always recognize each other when you're out and about. And it's like, I know you. Start talking, and sure enough, it's like there's this connection that you can connect right immediately. In a movie theater, in the men's restroom, that. So be encouraged. You know, God is just doing amazing things through you. And God wants to use this church to reach this city. And some, every one of you has a part to play. Every one of you. And you can't do it unless you're unified. And your pastor is the leader. And all of you work together. Something, last story, and I'll tell you, and then I'll, I'll go. We're probably almost there, but I'll tell you the last thing. Uh, Savannah came up this summer and said, hey, we, we should take this uh, personality test. And Savannah's over here on my team, second one in the front row. And so she, uh, she uh, said, let's take this personality test. And I thought, man, I've taken hundreds of those tests, and, you know, they all kind of lead to the same place, and I know who I am, and, and I'm this type A, type T, type whatever, you know, I'm all that, and I already know all that stuff. And so, no, but this is different, this is different. Oh, okay. And so then we take this test, and sure enough, it's different. And so it still pegged me as the same part that I knew that I was, but what it did do was say, uh, you got some unhealthy features in your personality. And I go, yeah, I know that already. Yeah, I'm working on that. Uh, and it starts pointing out these unhealthy things. Is it a Christian, it's a Christian organization, or is it just not? It sure seems like it, just because of the way they deal with the health and unhealth of our personality. But what I realized was, there's a healthy part that God created me to be. And he created you to be. And he created our pastor to be. And we're all different. And when we're, and we're walking in that healthy state, guess what happens? Unity, and we all work together, and amazing things happen. But when we're, when we're walking in the unhealthy part, all chaos breaks loose. And then the finger pointing and the na 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 and the wah 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 and all that stuff happens and we're done. And then you can't trust and you can't trust this person, you can't trust that person. Well, frankly, you can't trust each other in the unhealthy part anyway, right? So how do you get to the healthy part? Through Christ Jesus. Because he's the perfect one. He's what makes it healthy. And he created you. He created me. So don't think because you've got a weird personality or a hard personality or a soft personality or you're behind the scenes or you're in front of the scenes or whatever it is, you know, it doesn't matter. God created it that way and it's supposed to be and then he's going to take it in this body and somehow mix that all together and make it work and then we will be his hands and feet, the beautiful feet of the gospel. And with why he's chosen to do that, I have no unearthly idea. But I tell you this, I am so grateful that he has because when he does that through me, oh my, I don't want to do anything else. I don't want to do anything else. I just want to serve him. I want to be wherever he's at. Wherever you're at, I want to be. Just listen, uh, right? And if you don't know that, don't feel that, then you're going to be one of those other two people. You're going to be the dead man walking or you're going to be the old crotchety fish bait. All right? if, you, if you're relating and you go, I'm relating to the live, then that's why there's unity in this room. If you're not relating, I'm just, just see it and tell it how it is, you know? It is what it is. That's where you've got to be honest with yourself and say, all right, Lord, help me see. And I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are. Right? God will use every single one of us. I don't care if you're 6th grade or 60 or 90 or whatever. Every, it, it, y'all, everybody has something to bring. Die to self. Allow Christ to live. And watch 
what happens. Right, church? Amen. So um, I'm going to pray for us, and uh, I, I, I really hope you hear um, the encouragement today that God is using you, and uh, I'm blessed to, to be here and uh, be a part of uh, all of this. You know, my friends here, and watch what they do every day, and, and, uh, and by the way, it's really hard what they do, and you may not understand all what happens at camp, but it's 16, 17 hour days, and it's doing a lot of cleaning, and a lot of sweating, and a, a lot of cooking, and you, know, you name it, and they do it all, and it's just, it's just not easy, and they don't, the ones who are dead self, they don't complain, they just, hallelujah, and they get excited when they see those kids and adults surrender to Christ Jesus, and their lives are spent. Matter of fact, I think it's uh, Colossians 3.16. You might even throw that up for the last thing we'll look at. Uh, is it three, no, let's see. I'm sorry. It's not that one. It's um, first. Let me see if I, I wrote it down. Second Corinthians 12.15. That's it. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 15. Yeah, let's put that one up. I don't know if I gave you that one or not. I may not have. But 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 15. He says, I will most gladly spend and be expended for your soul. I'll be very gladly spend and be spent for your souls. That's the secret to the abundant life. It's being spent for others. So if your life is about that, and that's what my friends are about, that's what you are about, I guarantee you, I'll sit with you for five minutes, and you're going to have stories to tell, and there's going to be something on your face, and you're going it, to, it's, it's something different. And God redeems us from the deepest parts of the darkness. You just know it's all for Him. I don't know if there's anything else to say today, but... Praise the Lord. I mean, God is good. And uh, I hope you're hearing, the, hearing that today. So, amen. Well, let's pray. Is there uh, anything else? To... All righty. So, we'll stand. And...